I'm going to give a quick introduction. My name's Lud Ramsey, born in London and grew up in London. Face racism in all its different forms. I joined the RAF, that's when I found out what racism was really about. After leaving the fire service in the RAF, I joined the National Fire Service in Hampshire as the first black firefighter. I later on became the national chair in the fire brigade union of the black and ethnic minority members. And doing that role, I had to represent black firefighters up and down the country who have suffered discrimination. But today I'm here to talk about one brigade in particular, and that's Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service. The first main case I had to deal was with was in 2004, Havana Spiney, a young individual who suffered racism on a horrific scale. It affected him so badly. Unfortunately, he took his life. And when he took his life, I, his brother contacted me and phoned me up and he told me that he left me something. He left me a box. And in that box, all that his brother said, it's just got your name on it. And he said, Lud will know what to do with this box. Well, I, I dodged it, you know, for a number of years. I retired from the fire service in 2014. And for a number of years, I had it in the back of my mind. I had to do something and I dodged it. But then one day I had a dream. I saw him standing there looking at me and just shaking his head. And then I knew I had to do something. Woke up that morning, first call, phoned up Marcus. Marcus, I need that box. Myself and my friend, Simon, we went down, we got the box and here it is today. So that is symbolic of this journey we're about to take. So, one of the things which I, as a black individual, like is, I like the Stonewall Index. The Stonewall Index, that is the workplace, shows how good employers act to the LGBT community. That's been going for a number of years, and a number of people have won it. The last winners were Newcastle City Council. They have demonstrated that they are an inclusive workplace. People from the LGBT community can feel that they could go in that company and they would be able to have a good working relationship with their employers and their employers could get the best out of it. But us, as a black in community, we don't need to know that information because if I'm lucky enough to work for Newcastle City Council, they would be able to respect me as a person, as an individual, they will be able to respect what I could bring to that company. We, as the black community, we need to know the bad employers so that we can avoid them like the plague. Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service, they are recruiting for firefighters. After you watch this video, if you're a black individual, you have to make some serious choices. You have to make some serious choices if you feel that you are strong enough to come into an organization like this. You will see some interviews and you will see the consequences of two firefighters who we have lost. My name is Simon Peter Green. I'm an ex-firefighter and FBU trade union rep who has served, who served in Hampshire for 23 years. In 2003, I was sacked for carrying out my duties as a trade union rep. I first become aware of the horrific racism in Gloucester in 2004 when Ivana Spiney reached out to Ludd for some support. As a white man, I have seen the impact of racism and how it manifests in its many different forms. When I see racism, I challenge it. I've written a letter to the Chief Fire Officer of Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service. Dear Chief Fire Officer, I have recently read the HMI inspector's report into the Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service. Amongst other matters, it states that 41% of your workforce 
feel that they have been bullied and are harassed, and 32% feel discriminated against. Frankly, this is beyond my comprehension. For over 18 years, I have personally witnessed glimpses of the horrific racism, bigotry, and the relentless attacks black firefighters have received from management and colleagues of Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service. I have personally witnessed the indescribable pain, suffering and stress caused to the families of black firefighters as a result of this relentless abuse. So far, there have been two deaths, namely Ivana Spiney and John James. I am now hearing stories that women are being abused and harassed, and as a result, some have left the fire service. You and your management team are responsible for this. Please explain to me in writing what you are going to do about this situation. How are you going to transform the service and move it out of the dark ages into the current century? Who will be the next to die? I believe that Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service is an unsafe workplace for black women and minority firefighters. This must stop now. Ludd and I have made this film in memory of John James and Ivana Spiney. But we want to, it to inspire you to take some action. We're going to show you how racism works. We're going to show you how racism shows, creates fear. This video, we wanted to show some of the employees, the current employees who work for black employees, who work for Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service, serving today. But they were all too frightened to come and speak. But we contacted some of the retired black firefighters. These firefighters work for the service for a number of years. And all of them are today are still affected by what that service did. We're also going to be talking to John James's family. They unfortunately have suffered the loss of their husband, brother, father and grandfather. They are living with that loss for the rest of their lives. You will be able to see how it has affected and broken that family. And that was done by Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service and their actions. So when you've watched the film, as a viewer, what action can you take? And this is so simple. We're asking for this. Please join our Facebook page by searching for the box bundle. Please send a letter to the chief fire officer as the one I just read. Please contribute to our a fighting fund and this is to raise money for a legal team to take this on and please share 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 the information and the film and try to encourage others to stand up this must stop John was very much a um, what's right's right he's not um he was never one to shy away from telling anybody if he thought it was wrong. And there was a couple of incidents with a firefighter originally uh, with bullying and John spoke about it and it was hard, but he said what was right was right. It was, as Sarah stressed already, John's philosophy was what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And all he ever said was what they were doing was wrong. I mean, when the situation came about with the lady at the watch and the comment that was made me and john had a conversation the same day about it and he was like tim what would you do if it was you and i says john you've got to look at it realistically if that was your daughter working there and someone made a derogatory comment towards her what would you want done i said so you've you've got to do the right thing by it i said because if it was my daughter i know i'd be in there ripping off heads i said so do what you've got to do and he says, all right, then he went to see HR. John was made aware of an issue with a female firefighter. Um, he spoke to HR off the record. 
HR told him that um, unless she came forward, they couldn't really do anything about it. John had a week's holiday, came back off holiday, and then they marched him into the office, made it blatantly clear that John was the person that had raised the concern, and interviewed him. But when he went to see HR, he was doing it on the understanding it was part of the whistleblowing. So you can't be highlighted, you can't be brought into the public light, it was just done. And that's when, it all, that's when the bullying started, that's when it got really nasty. To the point, people wouldn't sit with him um, at mess, um, people wouldn't talk to him, they ignored him. They, just, they, they Basically, they singled him out. My dad was risking his life every single day going to work and he was having to run into burning buildings, risking his life to save others with people that hated him for the colour of his skin. You cannot imagine the pain that my dad had to go through, putting his life on the line, not knowing the, the team you're in, the networks around you that they're not supporting you, and, and potentially could have cost him his life every single day. I couldn't imagine what that life was like to feel for him, who to feel, that knowing that he, you know, he could, the last time he could walk in and, and they could potentially just walk out and leave him from the colour of his skin. I think it's disgusting. And I think, I think this should be, not only be ashamed of himself, but I think he should be accountable for their actions. To the point where John took it to a tribunal because he felt he was being victimised for doing the right thing. But when I used to see him, the stress on his face, he'd, he'd, he'd constantly say, he'd, when I come to see him, he'd run upstairs, get papers and statements and, and, and the stress that he was going through, it, it, it was really was painful. Um, the different things that people had said, he couldn't understand. I think the biggest thing for my dad was he couldn't understand why people were lying. When he was doing, when he was trying to do the right thing, why people were lying against him, I think that was the hardest thing for him to understand. He didn't understand why he was tr being treated the way he was. I mean, it took a long, long time for us to get to tribunal, um, and he was ecstatic. But then he said to me at the end of the tribunal that this is when it would all begin. And I thought he meant there'd be a change. But I think what he actually meant was this is when it got really hard. And it did get, it got worse, it didn't get better. I think John assumed he would win the tribunal, what was right was right, and that he could go back to work. But it didn't work like that. They wouldn't so have him back he, on the watch. he won his tribunal, but mm. did he ever get an apology from anyone? No. And the people that he took to tribunal were demoted, but within six months they were re-promoted. So actually there was never any real consequence to the allegations that were made and, and were found to be true. Yeah, it just it just wasn't a good place for him to be in, to be honest. Um, you know, it, they were saying that he, he, every time I seen him, he had, he was diff there was something different. It wasn't just the fact that he could deal with one issue and try and put it to bed. It was always just, there was something, oh, the, they're on, he's on leave, he's been he's, he's been sacked, but then he hasn't been sacked. So then there's a, this was a tribunal, then there's his pension. There was always something, tr there was always something in pulling him apart at, at any different time. So yeah, it was, it was, um, it was demanding on him, definitely demanding on him. John was told that um, he couldn't go back to the watch because some people wouldn't let it go and it was toxic. Um, so then they wanted to um, basically retire him. But John had done four years of stress and then we found out that John obviously had a brain tumour and I believe that the stress from the, from the tribunal and everything that got on before that made a significant difference to John's health. John never drank really, he didn't smoke, he didn't do drugs, he wouldn't even take a paracetamol if he got a headache. He was the fittest firefighter on their watch. He played football four times a week, but all of a sudden John's got a brain tumour. Where would that come from, other than from the stress? I can't, I genuinely believe it, it was all consuming for him. Every day there would be something else, a letter would drop and they were going to dismiss him. Then they were going to cut him and they weren't going to pay him his, his sick pay. Then they weren't going to pay him his uh, pension. Then they'd reinstate him. Then they sent him to occupational health and they didn't like that. So they sent him to a different occupational health. John had counselling. We're talking about a six foot four big man, strong man, who pretty much crumbled to nothing because of the act of certain people because he believed what was right was right. It hurt, to be honest, if I'm totally honest with you. Because for me, it was the first time I saw a weakness in my dad. Um, and for me, as, a, as his daughter, I used to look up to my dad as being invincible. Nothing could ever really touch him. He was like this hierarchy that I put on a pedestal. So 
when all this started to come alight, I could see how it was affecting him. There. So, <laughs> I have a daughter, we have a daughter who um, is currently having counselling to deal with the fact that her dad's gone. She's really angry. Um, I've got two beautiful granddaughters. John was there at the birth of both, but with the second, with our youngest Flossie, John was my daughter's birthing partner. And she is the spit of him. And it's hard because she loves her Uncle Tim. Mm. Um, so I know that her and John would have been really close. And he's not going to see that. Mm. You know, Kyla wants to get married, but she's not going to have her dad walk her down the aisle. So it's hard. But... You know, I'm blessed to have married him, loved him. Yeah. And had the time. Yeah. And I asked him if things were different, like if he knew then what he know now, would he do it again? And he said, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, John's not here now, and I know he would still fight the fight if he was here. Um, and John always said if it just meant that one person didn't have to go through what he went through, then he would continue it. And that's why I do this. John's gone and nothing's going to bring him back. Um, but people need to realise that this still happens. It still happens. And, you know, if Kayla or Daniel said to me, you know, we want to be a firefighter, I would absolutely tell them not to because they would never get a fair crack of the whip. And that's really unfair. Yeah. Because it should be on merit and not on the colour of your skin or your ethnicity or your sex. You're either good at the job or you're not. You know, and John was good at the job. And he should have been, he should have got higher. But I can't in my head. I just said, uh, you know, and I, I no one can say nothing. It, it ain't going to change anything. But I just feel I didn't do enough. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm very nervous. Yeah. I just can't believe it. No, no. Yeah. I've got it, I've got it. I have no, sh I have no shame showing my emotion for. No, no, no. You're going to give me a million. Make a try. When you're ready. Okay. Yeah, um, like I was saying, um, he was like a brother to me, uh, a younger brother in some ways, and an older brother in some ways. But it said, I, I, I slowly watched them chipping away at him, chipping away at him. Um, uh, and if you ask me, um, is he... Is he dead because of fire service? Yes. Yes, he is. I can know. He's a strong he's a strong guy, he's a powerful guy. He's a very and you, you he, he, he's had that aura about him, like, you know, he's a you speak to um people like, you know, like within the fire service and with John, he was um he's part of the extrication team that um the, the fire service had. He was really and he was he was fire he, he was fire service through and through. Like, you know, you could I've never met a um, a black firefighter like him who was like well not within my brigade anyway who was is willing to get on. He didn't deserve what had happened to him in Gloucester Fire Rescue Service, and if anybody knows about Gloucester Fire Rescue Service, I do, because I keep up with the dossier. I do. So any questions you want to ask, you ask me, and I will tell you. Not only that, I might give you the date. No, I know we can't give the names right now because it's legal but i can give you the names too that's why i fight and i feel in my heart and i must say this before i continue i feel that i didn't do enough you know what i mean to help him but at the same time my hands were tied my leg was tied and my mouth was gagged and i'm openly telling people that that they were gagged john james was a decent human being
That's why I speak to his daughter. I just feel like, you know, well, duh. <sighs> Never done enough. And I think it's me personally, I think I've never done enough. I feel like I killed them. <sighs> but um, um, they killed him. I th and I would put it out there, mate. That's what they did. They, I don't care who, who sees this or who hears it. I'll, I'll, I'll only say they killed him. They killed him. Like, didn't they? May not be murdered, but it's at least manslaughter. And that's what, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not scared of saying that. Like, you know, I'll say it to anybody. You don't realise, actually, how many people have problems that have been going on for such a long time. It's like with John, John James, you know. Um, I wonder why John was always so sort of like angry. When I actually spoke to him, I was blown away. Because I didn't, I used to hear about John, and then they would, but again, they were, um, they were sort of stressing him for this, that, and the other. I didn't know half the story until I actually took John to one side and then the gravity of it sort of like came into light. You know, and uh, so I said, John, I'll ring you tonight, rang him. I used to ring John every day, sometimes twice a day when we were off and everything. Very, got very close to John, an amazing character, an amazing person, an amazing bloke. You know, and uh, one of the most honest people I have ever met in my life, literally. This can't go on. I thought this is impossible. This cannot, this, how can this be so unfair where I live? And um, I suffered a lot of secondary stress, which I actually didn't realize from um, John's death and John's situation. I also went to um, occupational health with John. And what I saw there was, I'm going to shake my head. I've been with John, spoke to him all this time, went to Occy Health, and John just collapsed. And John was so, messed up and broken because he couldn't understand why they wanted to lie against him but just doing the right thing most of it is fear for a lot of people but they don't come forward even the girl that capitulated on the stand who john went with his heart and soul because he trusted her you know um enjoyed her company as a firefighter and a colleague and a friend he went to save that girl from um, the repellent sort of words of um, the station, the watch manager, whoever he was, you know, and then it escalated. But she feared so much what was going to come her way because she um, sort of like sided with John. Had she sided with John the whole way, you know, she just thought it, it wasn't, it was a no brain of her to sort of like rebuff what John said and also capitulate. And it ultimately killed John. It literally did. That stress that John and I experienced was, well, if I if I could bottle it, you drink it as if as what John James went through. I think you, I think you'd mess yourself. Your head would fall off, and that's what killed him, most definitely. And also, Ivanos went through it. You know, he's also not here either. Um, he never ever got over what experiences he went through at Gloucester either. And well, I think it's the for a little place, literally two minutes drive from my house when it was on Eastern Avenue in Gloucester, you know, I've lived here all my life. More than a lot of people actually join the job that come from outside. And that was my little fire, ser fire service in Gloucester. But I didn't know behind that facade how cancerous it was for black people. Yeah, the brow beating continues within the brigade and obviously people say, well, I ain't got long to go. And say, I understand that, but why should you even think like that? Because it also makes you think like that because that is the institutional racism in there. The lack of leadership really, isn't it? You know, when it's like, the thing that always gets me still, I think when John was told you can't come back into fire service because it's toxic, well, hang on, you're the chief, you're the county council, you expel these people. You've got the cancer there, cut it out, no. You've got to go, what, for being honest? This is your own policy. This is their own policies and procedures. They're not prepared to actually action. The weakness from top, well, from top, weakness is at the top, isn't it? The bottom, 
If you're good at the top, you'll be good at the bottom. I joined the fire service and uh, initially, um, and predominantly, the fire service was um, all white. It was a white male orientated uh, service. If I go back to my early career, um, sort of late 80s, um, Warren Mann was a retained firefighter but in Painswick and was subject uh, to uh, harassment, uh, a racial uh, intensity and was bullied out of the service effectively. Well I spoke to Warren Mann, Warren was telling me the issues that he was having and he said to me, um, what do I do? I convinced him to sort of take him on. Um, uh, what I said to him was, if you run away now, you're running for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, and then the rest of the history, like, you know, the, um, the, um, the guys that were at um, Painswick Station, as it was, they gave him a hard time. You find that um, the reason for that was just typical of a sort of retained village then, whereas you had retained firefighters was um, when run the pub, when run the chemist, when run the the, um, the, um, the local garage. They're all like Trumpton, it's that sort of thing. And they gave him a hard time, whereas you run him out of the, running him out of the village. Um, Leroy Phil Potts, he left the uh, RAF and joined the fire service known him personally for a very long time and he was subject to occasional incidents of uh, what I believe racial discrimination. Um, he was actually arrested on parade without any uh, due diligence paid to doing an investigation which uh, I still can't fathom. It would at that point in time uh, it made me feel that it was definitely down to the colour of his skin. I continue, uh, uh, Van Spiney, um, uh, a lovely fella, uh, really uh, charismatic, um, honest as you know the day is through um, and that Van Spiney had made allegations of bullying and harassment and racial intimidation. Um, so I was made aware of those prior to me joining the watch and that, um, you know, I said, hey, you, what, what, what do you expect me to do about this? And uh, they said, well, Avalos has made these allegations and I had to either, uh, it was indicated I had to uh, validate or, uh, you know, dissuade those uh, allegations. The allegations were absolutely true and founded. Um, I identified one of the perpetrators to management. Um, he was subsequently moved to a different station but that was the limit of the sanction. And the other perpetrators on the watch it just pushed it underground. When it came to Vanos Duncan caught, caught a firefighter, bang to rights, bang to rights this guy was, got it into the, I mean, old, um, took it into the front office, because Duncan rang me, and he said, what do I go, what do you got to do, mate? Like, you know, take and get into the front office, get to the front office, what did they do? Their answer, move this guy. Move him like, you know, he should, they, they should have, he should be under drawn and cord. It seemed that uh, once you'd found something and proved something that uh, the management were incapable of dealing with it. Following Avanos, uh, Nathan Lewis had a, a sexual harassment uh, allegation made against him which was uh, unfounded. An officer came to me and he went, you better let it go or you'll lose your job and your pension. That's when I stopped and thought, hang on a minute, are you telling me that literally I am right about something and now you don't want me to pursue it? 
put in for your ADC. Carry on with your, your, your good five, five, but I wouldn't let it go. So, <laughs> it just, it, when I think about it, it must be crazy. I thought to myself, this is absolutely bizarre. I suggest you forget about it and don't go around talking about it. Letters right there if you want to. Letter. Sorry, well, we got covered the name of this person because it's illegal, but there you go. And I've got hundred more of documents of these that they actually sent to me and think I haven't got. Why I'm saying that is because in 2006, when all this happened, uh, in 2007, a watch manager who's, um, I keep his name, I, uh, wow. I don't, I don't have to keep his name off. Um, his name is Duncan Sign. I rang him and told him what was going on, and, and he just spoke up for me and, and, and started to help me in many ways. He got me out of Stroud, really. Got me out of Stroud, got me onto Station 5, um, where I was um, still suffering, but I was a lot better than I was before. So in other words, he, he was looking after, look, looking after my, my, my um, well-being and my interests, which for one for him really, uh, to be honest, I wouldn't have been here. And if it weren't for him, I don't think John would have survived that long. And I must say this, I know I'm cutting back a bit, but I will say this. The way they treat him, and by the way, this is a Caucasian Englishman born here. The way they treat him, because he had the decency to have equality, diversity, dignity, this is what this man had. He saw wrong and he said, no, you can't do that, let's do this. The way they treat him, not giving him his promotion, not doing that, shows you that if you go against those people with anything that's right, this is how they come out with it, right? Now, back to this thing. This is what they've done, right? This is how they work. If you don't follow their code, you're getting nothing, and they're going to make sure that you are dealt with in a way that you're never coming back. And it seemed that management were quite prepared to hush it up, uh, brush it under the carpet as though nothing happens. And that seemed to be the, the flavour of trying to deal with these difficult issues. Uh, management would not deal with them, would not wrestle the nettle, would not uh, have the sensitivity or the emotional intellect to even deal with it. Um, so uh, at various times, uh, Nathan, certainly Ivanos, uh, and other uh, black firefighters would confide in me because they appreciated that I did have a understanding um, and empathize with their cultural differences compared to uh, a white Caucasian and the old boys sort of club that existed and sadly uh, probably my biggest uh, regret is John James um, and sadly um, you know he came to me uh, with the allegation uh, that he had uh, witnessed um, the events where a female firefighter was degraded to uh, or alluded to perform some acts before being allowed into uh, the common room um, and he asked my advice and uh, I said to John at the time I said um, you're caught between a, a rock and a hard place knowing the facts of uh, seeing what had happened previously with these sometimes would seem difficult situations, but I don't see them as difficult. I see that as a conversation and, uh, you know, a level playing field where people are judged equally and properly on the evidence that's being levelled. That doesn't seem to take place. And uh, I said to JJ that I advised him to speak to HR, uh, in, within Gloucester County Council to seek their advice and to probably do this off the record um, in that way hopefully protecting his uh, identity circumstances um, 
unfortunately um, he got that advice he knew he leveled the allegation and then subsequently went through an absolutely horrendous appalling time even to um, the extent that uh, John lived in Birmingham and as we all know has to travel down the M5 to get to work and if he was running late due to traffic or whatever he would always ring to say or oh, get somebody to stand in so there would be cover and you know there'd be no problem with uh, you know having an, enough people on the fire engine to respond to a call um, and he always ensured that that happened um, and because management felt that uh, they could, they altered the standing policy to make that impossible for John to actually meet. So nobody could stand in. It was well known that nobody would uh, was. It would be deemed um, detrimental to them if they stood in for John if he was running late. So he was he was targeted absolutely, and you know, sadly, uh, John lost his life, and sadly, uh, Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service uh, would probably say, and I have heard them say that uh, they wouldn't stand for racism, they wouldn't stand for inequality of any sort, but. You know, I sit here today and say, I believe Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Services institutionally races and has been since I joined, and that's 30 years. But I do think um, that there is very much um, a old school boys club that exists, it's uh, known about. And if you rock the boat, they, there will be consequences. And yes, I believe that um, I've suffered those consequences for standing up for the rights of individuals that are different to me. Yep. Because if you had a transfer to another brigade, what rank do you believe you could get to in the fire and rescue service? Yeah, but how do you think it's affected? affected? I think had I uh, chose to move on uh, into a different organisation, given the fact that yeah, I won the Silver Axe, um, again with an outstanding record, um, I would assume that I would at least have got to area manager, possibly deputy, you know, I could have probably gone all the way. John, he tried to follow and uh, their policies and, and regulations. Nobody else, they writ it. If you see something and someone come to you, you have to duty, duty bound to report it, right? He didn't report it in that way because he think that it would be embarrassing or, or troublesome. He did it confidentially. So by law, they should handle that confidentially. No. They closed the station, his name up on the thing first, right? Another thing, it's just, oh God. They pressurize the black people in there. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that they don't pressurize Caucasian and anybody else. What I'm trying to tell you is us as what we're in there. They pressurize them individually so they don't come together. Because if they come together, they would stand as a unit. They pressurize them individually so that they have to concentrate on their families and thinking, but if I do this, it'll affect my family. As if it affects them, right, and not their family, they'd probably stand up, but it affects their family, right? You look at what happened to John James. You look at what happened to me, right? A Vanus by me, right? I met a Vanus in, I think it's 2001, right? And many, I, many people don't know this. I know a Vanus by me instructor martial artist, because that's what I am. Uh, and I always used to joke with him saying, you can't kick, and we always had a laugh. And then he told me what he was going through. And the funnest point, he told me what was going on. And my jaw dropped. My jaw dropped. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, they're doing this to me, they're doing that to me. They're do and I'm like, what? 
What, what do you mean they're doing that? So that's what, that was 2001, my eyes start to, I sort of like flip back a bit. I start to literally start to think, what is this service like? What, you know what I mean? But I couldn't judge because I'm a, I'm a probationer. But when I got to where it happened to me with that female, I start to think these people don't look like they care for anyone who is slightly different. They don't look it, but I can't exactly say it. As I've stayed in the service more longer, I realize actually this organization is institutional racist from the top down. Very institutional racist, very bigoted, archaic. They do not have any um, equality policy because if you have equality policies, you don't behave like that. You don't have regulations. You don't have trained officers to deal with that. You have officers that you promote, but they never went to any courses or any educational outside to be able to bring insights to make that work. That's when I start to realize the, the longer I was in the service. By the time 2012 came, I realized these people are actually not very skilled in understanding and dealing with people of a different ethnicity. When I left the forest service, it just exploded. I, d I don't know what happened. I was just hearing, I was, I was at home and I'm just hearing things after, there was things all the time going on. Even to the point where I think they had, at the time I'd left, nine, ten, only ten black firefighters, right? And all of them, Every one of them had notes to file. And you think to yourself, right? Because I spoke to Duncan at the time, like, you know, and Duncan could leave or no. And I went, well, someone needs to do something. I goes, what about the Furniture Work Committee? It's gone. What's gone? Just after I left, disbanded that. <laughs> like, you know, and then what you had then was the qualities was um, people that they wanted. You, you had no... Um, union representation actually on there look. so it didn't go anywhere this has been going on since 1990 so let me break it down for you the first firefighter black firefighter joined in 1990 okay he was a, drawn off the parade right and accused of taking money from a social club only to find that the decimal point was put in the wrong place now this is a black firefighter, the very first. The second was Warren Mann, Painswick, right? He, the racism that went on in there, dragging him out of the street, you know, taking his family to whatever, right? The union came in, they take that to tribe union. The next one was Avanas Biney, okay? Your firefighters put in itching powder in his kit, N-word, and, and writing N-I-G-G -G in his kit, uh, itching powder in his bed, shaking him around in, 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 in a, in a, um, a platform uh, ladder up there, right? This is the third one. Right. The fourth one was actually Errol, which was sitting in the seat earlier on. They accused him of stealing diesel from a, a, a flatbed lorry. No, he got permission to do that and he put his own money in it. I knew that because I saw him driving there. When he parked up at that lorry and they came, the, the lorry's full of diesel. Where do you get diesel from? Here's a receipt. There's no apologies for none of this. There's none. The next one is a firefighter who's still serving, right? Not a firefighter, but I'm not gonna say, I'll just call him A, still serving. He's on watch. A officer who's retired now with his full pension had to go at him in racial terms to the fact that that guy got up and was going to smack him. But I can't mention the, the, a, the a name of that person, right? That is the next incident. After that was me. These are all black firefighters, right? You give note to files to 100% of the black firefighters in Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Services the former chief fire officer of Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service said, and I quote, ask any black firefighters that was in there. Yes, Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service is institutional racist. And for a black firefighter to sit in the front seat of a Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue appliance is like throwing stones at a glass ceiling. 
this is an, <laughs> they, they, you know, we have a fire authority and it don't seem like any of this get towards them because it looks like one set of rest of people are treated in a way that is just totally and utterly unfair. Look, remember, this is the 20s, you know, 20th century. This ain't 1625 and it shows AK-1962. Gloucestershire had three tribunals. The tribunal are always to do with ethnic minority. 100% note to files on black people. Now, if that's, not, if that's not racial discrimination going on there, go and look. Oh, I will say this on the record. The FBU, you got a problem. And I will be asking a few questions after this to them. You is a world kickboxing champion. And you can't even get to the first level of promotion in the bar and rescue service. Tell us why you think that is. You could be a world champion and you can't even get to the first rank. Of all my battles that I've had, I've had some tough battles in kickboxing. This is the worst battle I've ever had in the fire service, dealing with something mental. Look, <laughs> we all know what it, <laughs> how tough it is to get promotion. But not when you have people who are being sort of like helped and those who haven't been helped. I find it very tough to believe that fire, black firefighters all can't be promoted. I, f I find it so tough. And the reason why I didn't get promotion is because I didn't side with what they were doing. I wouldn't remain silent. I wouldn't actually um, just take what they said. I, I wouldn't go along with what they say. And anyone in that service who went along with what they wanted, you get promoted. If you didn't go along with what they wanted, you don't get promotion. They're leaving because Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service, on the record, for a Caucasian, it's a career. For a black person, it's a job. It means you go there and you just got a job. Those black people in there definitely are feeling threatened. They're feeling threatened because one, your pension, your job, mainly family. And that's why it's about your family. They have physically found a template of putting in, if you don't do this, you lose your job and your pension. That is a template that will make anyone sit down. If Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service is honestly and openly fair, why was an officer allowed to retire after smashing up a brigade car, drunk, right? Mash it up, right? Uh, wasn't even in the car with his, with his wife. Right, mash up the car, smash up everything, excuse my Jamaican language, and was allowed to retire with full benefits. But John James, who followed the policies, the regulations, and all that you have written in the county council, and you give him the lowest pension, and then actually let him come out of the job with practically nothing. Now, if that isn't racist, prove to me that what we've got here as evidence, come and prove it that we're lying. We are not alone. Female are now coming forward. I've got a few calls and a few letters and stuff, uh, a few calls and texts and stuff about what has they been going through. And those officers who are messaging me and saying I support you or whatever, stop. Don't do that. Right? Because when I was in there, you should have supported me while I was in there and the black people while they were in there. Don't send us any message to tell us, oh, we're going to support you now. Uh, listen, um, you know, I've always, sorry, I've um, always supported you then. And don't, you know what I mean? Don't. What I want you to do is support my black colleagues in there now. Don't support me or, or, or mention it about what you, look, you've got other black people in there, you've got females, support them. The whole place is festering with bigotry, racism, sexism, and it's archaic. One thing needs to be done, you need to start from the top down and it's a national inquiry. You want a national inquiry, you need to seize all their emails, all their files in there, and you need to go through it. And I tell you, the day that happens is the day people will realize that that place is infested with a bunch of, and I have to be calm when I say this, a bunch of 
institutional racist, bigoted, and people who do not understand the word diverse, multi-diverse, racism, or equality. I was approached because one of the new employees asked if they could become a retained firefighter. Close by, almost across the road, was a fire station. They were asking permission from the employer. And, I, and it came to me and I said, yeah, yeah. It was the lady. Yeah, yeah, of course. Give her the time off. And it was explained to me that when, when an alarm went off, she would have to leave her job and go. I was happy with that, very happy. Therefore, I've, I'm telling you this because I've always been a supporter of our public services. And this is one which is close to me or my company across the road. That was 15 years ago. In that time, other employees in other areas asked the same question, and they too became retained firefighters. But my story today is about the first one, a foreigner, a female, who joined as a retained firefighter. She went on all the courses that became available, and she really enjoyed every moment of her work as a retained. And she said then, as she says today, strangely enough, she, she's in the best job in the world. Just think about that. I, I am in the best job in the world. After about three years, four years, um, the opportunity came for her to become a full-time firefighter, and she applied, therefore she left my company, in which she excelled at every level. And I was very sorry to see her go, but wished her well. And I took it upon myself to follow her career very closely and offer support wherever I could. And she went on to do great things, many great things. She joined the International Firefighter Games, where they have a competition for the world's toughest female firefighter. Every two years she entered, every two years she won gold. And I'm very proud of that. In other words, she's got true grit to be able to do that. The reason I say she has true, true grit, she was during all her time within the fire service discouraged. Discouraged. It's almost unbelievable. I'm a leader in my companies, and I can see a company, the fire service, discouraging the talents of one of their employees. I find that absolutely incredible. I started to look a bit closer. I looked deeper, and it was worse than that. There was resentment that she was not just a good firefighter, but she was excelling in other areas. And there's one firefighter in the UK, a leader in one other area, I can't remember which, who said, Suzanne, in many ways, is the face of the fire service. She's remarkable. But still, I kept hearing these stories of harassment, bullying, sexism, misogynism, you name it. Not only that, I was picking up other areas of racism against um, employees of a different skin color. And the more I looked, the worse it got. But there's one thread running through the whole thing, and that is not poor management, not poor leadership, but no leadership. No leadership in a public organization as large as the fire service. Appalling leadership. Leadership that actually doesn't encourage their employees to put their hand up when there's a problem and say, there's something wrong here. Because if that person did that, the atmosphere that they've encouraged within their business is that you put your head above the power pit, you're going to get it chopped off. Or even worse, you're weak. We're going to pick on you because you're the easiest target. So every little nook and cranny with the Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service, I looked at. I was horrified.
I would love to say there was something positive in there from the leadership, but nothing. Mike, I could tell stories, loads of stories. She, she was invited to Woman of the Year. Woman of the Year, she partnered Dame Helen Mirren. She had to fight to get the time off. Any other employer would think, wow, let's use this. Let's use this, but no, they don't want that. And why? So there's this atmosphere of sheer fear from employees within the Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service. People are afraid to stand up and say, I'm vulnerable, there's something wrong, or there's an injustice. And instead of management, instead of leadership caring for their employers, employees, they're doing the exact opposite. They're perpetuating this fear, and they're using it as a control to get what they think, and this is how bad the management is, a more efficient organization. It is, it beggars belief. It really beggars belief. I gave you a little potted history about my past. If I ran my organizations the way the Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service run theirs, I'd be living in a trailer park now. But what is worse is we've lost good men and women, talented men and women, who've left the service. Some, I know, have died through worry of bullying, stress. It would bring tears to my eyes if I went into just one individual case. I am not prepared as an, as an adult, as somebody responsible for bringing somebody into the fire service to see this continue. It's got to stop. Someone has got to stand up. The firefighters have to be encouraged within, at, 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 the, at, at the work phase, to come forward without being scared of going home and saying to their wives, um, sweetheart, I, I've lost my job or I'm going to lose it or my job's become impossible to continue because of the atmosphere. Incidentally, while they've been preparing for their court cases, their defense, could you believe a leadership that gets its managers together before the court cases and instructs all of them and coaches them all to give the same message. The message is the same to their managers as it is to the guys on the rock face, at the work face. Lie, hide, and fake. <laughs> Lie, hide, and fake. Because once again, if you stick your hand up and say there's something wrong here, you're gonna be put down. You're gonna lose your job or your job is gonna become impossible. I've seen ethnic minorities, I've seen females leave the fire service <laughs> because they can't take it anymore. And these are people I'd love to have in my organization. Like I was so sad to lose a female firefighter to the fire service. Talent is leaving, talent is not getting room to grow and bloom and blossom, to get promoted, to make a difference. It's being put down. What's worse, we have nepotism. I don't know what else I could add to this cocktail of horror, but it's got everything. And it's a public service. Just think of that word, public service. It's, it's a great sacrifice to be a leader at any level because when things are going good, if you're a good leader, you let those below you take the credit. And you know what? When things go wrong, you take the hit. That's what being a good leader is. Reverse that because that is what's happening in the Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service. The wrong people are being rewarded 
and the people who should be taking the hit are nowhere to be seen. We can save lives. We can save heartache and despair by doing something about it now. And we have to do something about it. I don't care if people in high places get the chop. I really don't. Our duty are to, let's call them the nurses, the basic firefighter, the new people who are coming in. If we want more women, if we want more ethnic minorities in the fire service, we don't do it by ticking the boxes. Oh, we've got five now, or we've got 17% or 15% or 3%. I'm not interested in that. No, what you want is to get those numbers by the ones you've got working for you now, now going home and saying to their families, saying to their friends, I have got the best job in the world. I love my job. You have the ones that are working for you go home and say, I've got the best job in the world, instead of going home saying, do you know, I'm scared. There's some moron in a high place in the Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service who's produced a balance sheet or something. And I've been told, or we're all told, if we fall on the wrong side of the figures, our jobs might not always be there. Yeah, what a, if, 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 if you want to kill enthusiasm in any organization, that's how you do it. What we've seen is layers of bullies. Yes. You know, there's layers of bullies in this organization. Totally agree. And uh, until uh, these people are dealt with, and seem to be dealt with in a very public way um, that uh, there is a consequence. Because at the moment, there is no consequence. If a young black person is to come to you today and say, Nathan, you tend to be joining Cluster Fire and Rescue Service, what advice would you give him? I would honestly be open and clear with that person. I do not and will not endorse any black firefighter, young male or female, joining Gloucestershire Fire and Rescue Service at this time? No, I would say to him, look, do yourself a favor, go and look. And I point him, I look at other organizations, West Mids, London. Hell no, <laughs> hell no. No, not, not until there's equality down there. Racial equality at least, it, not until. I've had this. I've had this, I've had my own son, like my youngest son, he came in and he said, that right, John? I said, no. I said, no, no, no. We're not ready for you yet, mate. They have them, they have them Gloucester and Forest members are not ready for you. Um, and it's funny enough, a week ago, my daughter, and my youngest daughter, her, um, her partner, son-in-law, he, um, he said, she said that them, he's thinking about joining the fire service because they're, um, um, they're recruiting. And I said, and she said, oh, what do you think? I said, it'd um, be all right, he's white. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm to, what's the I said, yeah, he'd, he'd be all right. He's white. But knowing Rory as I do, like, I don't think he'd, um, he would, because he wouldn't tolerate it, if you know what I mean, like, he wouldn't tolerate it. Of my dad's experience, hell no, not a chance. Not a prayer. I'm not saying that that's the case across the, the whole of the nation, no. So I don't know, I haven't had any experience of it. But just purely what my dad through, went through, not a chance. Stop. And if any black person, if somebody else's dad was going to go in, I'd say no. But then again, I did think maybe I should join the service and I should go into Gloucester. And I will be that top chief that my dad wanted to be just to turn heads. I've had my career and I've seen all this play out and it causes me nothing but consternation to think that these people, and um, two of them we've talked about, uh, John James and Ranos, God bless their souls, are not here. And that is, a, as a, I believe, a direct result of their treatment within Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service, what they were subject to, and how they, uh, it affected their mental health and their their futures. Somebody has got to be made responsible. Somebody. I think by virtue of what we're doing today, 
uh, shining a light on what's going on um, we can actually show the world that this isn't just people having a beef about certain incidents um, I'm here to say look I've seen it and I'll go through those cases with anybody and say well you tell me that I'm wrong yeah I just think that people at that fire service just they just really really need to be held accountable for it yeah you know someone's really got to be held accountable for it not just yeah. one every single person that was involved yeah. at the yeah. time of what went on with John none of them should have had their jobs yeah. but I bet a lot of them have been retired on their decent pensions and John's pension was cut yeah. you know they did everything they could to bring him down and yeah. he was the only one that was standing for what was right it's not just happened it's been through successive chiefs it's 30 years of my life and i've witnessed it and sadly i tried and i failed but i hope this is going to shine a light on a very dark place illuminate it so people can actually see what's going on nothing we can say or do will bring john back you know Losing John's been one of the greatest losses in my life, in my nieces and my nephews. I don't think we've ever actually really come to terms with what's gone on. If it wasn't for, I do believe if it wasn't for the fire service, we'd still have John here now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? For all they've put him through, I still believe we would have him here now. But we've got to get up every single day now, face every single day for the rest of our lives without John. And these people are out there going on with their normal lives as if nothing's happened. Um, yeah, I just want to say to the people that did it, I want you to be held accountable. Um, and the apology that the, was it the chief on the radio said it wasn't actually an apology. He said that there was an institutional racism, and clearly there is. I mean, it wasn't an actual actual apology, and I think it was poor. And I think, you know, the way that you treated my dad during his service was disgusting. And no one answers. You know, I want you to explain why my dad isn't there no more. I want you to explain to my grand to his grandkids why he isn't here anymore. And I do hold you accountable for it. And I do believe that it was your fault because my dad had a brain scan in 2014 and he had no lesions on his brain and then all this started and then within three years he had two grade four brain tumours. Stress, it was the stress of the fire service, it was. And I want answers, when you go home to your kids at night, I want you to know, I'd, I'd just like you just to feel how we feel, you know. All I've got now left is my dad is, is a granite headstone that I have to clean and talk to. He ain't gonna be there on my wedding day. He ain't gonna be there to be in my last dance. He ain't gonna be there for, for the kids on their second birthday next week. You know, I want answers. I want you all to countable for it. And I want you. I, I wished you, you could just walk a week in our shoes. The eighteen months of him struggling through the chemo and the radiotherapy, him crying under the radiotherapy machine because it had to be screwed to him. The chemo every day, him being scared of dying. I wished you could just walk. The day that he had the bleeding, we had to sit there in the hospital and he couldn't swallow his own spit. You took all his pride from him. And I want you held accountable for it. And I will, till the end of my life, make sure that you will be held accountable for it. And if it means I've got to join the service, then so will be. But I will hold you accountable. And I will make a change. And if one person's family doesn't go through what I've gone through, then me and my dad have won. And I truly believe that. For any way forward for you, you've got to shake that tree. You've got to shake it real hard and see who falls off at the top. And hopefully from this, we will see a lot of people falling from the top. One of the quotes from Martin Luther King, which has always inspired me, inspired me as an individual. And that is, the question people ask myself is, why should I stop to help? the Black Gloucester Fire and Rescue fire, Firefighters. That is not the question. The question you should be asking yourself is, if I do not stop to help the Black Firefighters, 
in Gloucester Fire and Rescue Service, what is going to happen to them? That's the question. Cucumber. Cucumber. Oh, that's, that's nice. Celery. And what's your favourite TV show? Amelia. Amelia. Angry Birds. Daddy. Angry Birds. Yes. And what else? Did you go to school? What school did you go to? New A new one. And is it nice? Okay, good. And how old are you? Five. Five. That's big. How old's your sister? One. One. What? That's my sister like Peppa Pig. You like Peppa Pig? Peppa Pig. Peppa Pig. That's good. Anything else you want to say? Uh, no. 